Welcome to The Sounds of Sand, a podcast inquiring into the beauty and mystery of existence beyond ultimate truths. Welcome back to The Sounds of Sand podcast. This is Michael Riley. Before we begin today's episode, I just wanted to take a moment to say that if you would like to support this podcast and the mission of science and non-duality, please consider becoming a SAND member. In addition to supporting this podcast and the production of films like The Wisdom of Trauma and our monthly community gatherings, you'll gain access to our SAND member library with hundreds of videos from SAND's 15-year history of conferences, webinars, films, and courses. You can find out more at scienceandnonduality.com slash join, or find a link in the show notes. Today I'm in conversation with Lama Somo. Lama Somo is a spiritual teacher, author, and co-founder of the Namchak Foundation and Namchak Retreat Ranch, which preserves and shares Tibetan Buddhism practices in accessible contemporary ways. Under the tutelage of Tolku Sangak Rinpoche, international holder of the Namchak lineage, Lama Somo has done extensive spiritual retreats in the U.S. and abroad and is fluent in Tibetan. Today we discuss topics such as the relationship between the prominent schools of Buddhism in the U.S., how one balances mindfulness and heartfulness, the four immeasurables or Brahma Viharas, the importance of Sangha, chanting, and she leads us in a chant for an Avalokiteshvara during this episode, and the importance of balancing the two types of bodhicitta. All that and more on the Sounds of Sand podcast presented by Science and Non-Duality. All right, I'm here with Lama Somo. Thank you so much for being on the Sounds of Sand podcast. It's an honor to be with you today. Thanks. I'm happy to be here with you today. Yeah. Uh, just before we pressed record, we were, we were talking. So you were a speaker at the 2019 SAND conference. You did a very, very short talk, which we actually have on our YouTube channel. And I'm going to actually ask about the topics in that talk in a bit. But So I'm excited to spend you know an hour or more, who knows, um, getting more into your teachings and what you share with the world and your story. So thank you for being here today. You know, often I ask speakers to kind of give a little bit about their personal journey and what led you to Buddhism and ultimately to become a Lama? Well, as an American, of course, uh, it's not a given that you would become a Buddhist. (laughs) And um, I started out uh, just feeling that meditation was a really important tool uh, to make sure that I stay on track with my life and carry out my responsibilities in this life in the best possible way. Um, And so I uh, just kind of meditated on my own. I was living out in the country at the time, homesteading. Um, uh, I think now they would call it self-sufficient living. And um, which, frankly, I don't think is possible. (laughs) We aren't self-sufficient, really. But anyway, I um, was... A do-it-yourselfer is another way to say it. I had goats and uh, a big garden and that sort of thing. And I was way out in the country, and there was no way to really study meditation there. Um, You know, there was no such thing as internet (laughs) at the time. Mm -hmm. I'm that old. And um, so I was just doing my best with uh, daily meditation. And I was thinking, I'm probably not doing myself any favors doing this because I don't know what I'm doing. So I stopped. And five years later, I sort of came to myself and and said, wait a second, I'm off track in my life. And when I meditated, I was no longer having my lens focus outward and reacting to everything, but actually was inward. And so even with my bad meditation, um, I came to myself every day so that, uh, you know, things would bubble up that I just knew about who I was and where I needed to be and that sort of thing. And then when I got up after meditation and went about my day, 
all the thousands of little decisions were more on track because of mm-hmm. having come to myself on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. So I realized, you know, really what the value of meditation was for me. And uh, so then I thought, well, you know, when I wanted to learn piano, I got a teacher and then practiced. And so I want to learn to meditation. I should probably find a teacher. So then I, I got really deliberate about it and very focused. I wanted to like sound that note. So I made a list of the qualities I wanted in a teacher and what I didn't want in a teacher and everything. And I put that out in the universe. And uh, I didn't really care which religion it was, actually. It was just calling my teacher. And I met this Tibetan Lama who was amazing. And at first I didn't even realize, oh, this is the answer to my sound, a note that I'd sounded. But then, uh, you know, I realized, oh yeah, this is definitely my teacher. And, um, what I didn't have on the list was must speak English. I forgot that part. So (laughs) he doesn't. (laughs) So I had to learn Tibetan. (laughs) So that's just a uh, probably more of an answer than <laughs> you needed about no, no, that's... how I got to Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, and I just went down the rabbit hole with it because one uh, powerful practice after another, you know, it progresses you along a path where it, your mind is more and more refined and you lighten your karmic load more and more and you clean your karmic windshield more and more. My gosh, you know, is the, do I have something better to do than mm-hmm. that? <laughs> better than enlightenment? <laughs> I don't yeah. know what that would be. <laughs> so I just went for it. Yeah. So I did three years worth of um, a personal solitary retreat uh, because there wasn't a sangha to do the three-year retreat with. Uh, I was his first American student to do three-year retreat. Mm-hmm. And when I finished all the practices in the progression and so on, then he um, – gave me a llama hat in a ceremony and my kids pronounced me laminated. <laughs> so that's, that's how that happened. Beautiful. Mm. Yeah. It, it sounds almost like the path chose you in a bit because you put it out to the universe and it was just these teachings from Tibetan Buddhism were finding you. Yeah. Which um, Rinpoche feels, and I agree with him that uh, this is karma from before, mm-hmm. you know, this isn't the first time, I've encountered Tibetan Buddhism just the first time in this life. Yeah. Yeah, I think I had a similar thing with Theravada Buddhism. Like I was resonating with certain teachers and I didn't, it it took me a few years to kind of connect the dots and be like, oh, all these, you know, Jack Kornfield, Tara Brock, Mm -hmm. these people, they all study with the same people in Burma and Thailand. And, you know, Jack Kornfield was in the Thai forest tradition. And Mm -hmm. then it was kind of, I guess a, some uh, maybe a different channel, but an, another kind of American Buddhism path of going in the psychological, you know, the, the psychologists who came over from the 60s and 70s, and then uh, connecting with the the actual masters in Asia that they studied with. Yeah, and so I'm I'm actually kind of curious about that because I most of my friends and colleagues are are I, I have some friends in Zen and some in Theravada. What's the sort of relationship from American Buddhists between Tibetan Zen and, and Theravada? From the American Buddhist point of view, are you saying? Yeah, like you know, is what are some of the differences or, or overlaps? Ah, okay. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, just the differences in those different um, branches of Buddhism mm-hmm. are significant. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Theravada is considered, um, like the foundation. And if you don't have, um, a solid foundation in Shamatha and Vipassana, then it's difficult to, if I can keep the metaphor going, build the walls and the roof, mm-hmm. if you don't have the solid foundation. So Tibetan Buddhism does start with, with those practices, but especially in Tibet, they moved very quickly off of them into um, more um, Vajrayana um, practices, mm-hmm. uh, Mahayana and Vajrayana. And um, so that uh, was what the uh, first Tibetan lamas came over to this country and did, because that's what they knew. Uh, what they soon discovered was that Americans uh, have very jumpy minds. <laughs> mm-hmm. And we can't really fully get the benefit of the Vajrayana practices 
if we don't spend more time with the Theravadan sort of practices, uh, mm. shamatha and vipassana, for example. And uh, uh, we also need the four immeasurables with that, of course, the four Brahma Viharas, mm. as you would call it. Yeah. yeah, it seems like kind of a common path, at least in my circles of, of you know, seeing the benefits and feeling the benefits of mindfulness of the sort of clear, steady mind. And then for that to sort of blossom into more of a compassion, heart-centered practice. Um, do, you, do you find that, that the, there's a, a path there from sort of the classic mindfulness into more, uh, more heart-centered compassion practices? Uh, in our tradition, actually, it, it, we feel it's very important to progress on both uh, mm -hmm. simultaneously. So in a meditation session, you would do both mindfulness practice and, uh, for example, metta, or uh, I don't remember all the Sanskrit terms, but uh, we call it donglen, which is the compassion practice, and so on. So you actually do both and you continue to progress along both of the paths. Uh, and the way I see it is, um, it's kind of like, the mindfulness practices, uh, uh, shamatha and vipassana, are uh, helping us to see how reality really is and see that we're not separate. Uh, and the four Brahma Viharas are helping us to feel how we're not separate. And so to develop those capacities like the two wings of a bird uh, is very important for the bird to fly. And it's also very important because... Uh, as my teacher taught me, um, you don't want to develop um, insight uh, so much uh, without also developing compassion, or you end up with um, you know this, this kind of wisdom that doesn't have the guidance of compassion, uh, so that it, it can be a, a sword that cuts various ways. You know, we want to be sure that it cuts toward compassion. So, uh, the, but the problem with developing compassion, for example, which is one of the four Brahma Viharas, uh, without also developing wisdom, then you end up with, um, it's like a candle in the wind and it keeps blowing out. <laughs> so very important to see and feel how we're not separate. And I think these are key practices right now for our times because of all this us them thinking that's going on that is causing disasters all over the world i i think that's actually the root problem not only you know at this time but always and this is what has been taught in our tradition certainly that um the sort of mother of all samsara is um dualistic thinking um, self other right and so us them is the same idea it's the ego in the driver's seat we are identified with ego ego in itself is not a problem it can be a creative partner in you know beautiful work in the world or uh, you know in any sort of work but if it's in the driver's seat then this us them thinking which is a mistaken perception um begins to cause disasters because now everybody is putting themselves first against others. Um, so if I can go to a metaphor that I find really, really helpful, um, it's like there's this big ocean and, uh, you know, that's all of creation, all of actually all of reality. And all of us are waves and each wave is unique and it's obviously made of ocean. So if we can see the whole picture, then, um, of course, we're, we can work together uh, and we would naturally feel ultimate compassion, ultimate love, because we are ultimately connected. We are one great consciousness that has, um, you know, div divided itself into all these shapes and colors and so on and so forth and all of these waves. And it's constantly creating all of these waves out of just a joy of the dance, if you will. And, but then if I um, identify with as being just this one wave, then this other wave uh, can be a threat. They're going to mess me up or 
I also just need so very much because I've forgotten that I, I'm the whole ocean as well. And so then you get, um, you know, clinginess and neediness and so on, all of, you know, that sort of thing. And you also get aversion um, and aggression and co competition and so on. And all of this is ignorance. So those are the th called the three poisons. Uh, the uh, ignorance piece is one. And, and that's the first one is the mistaken perception. The second uh, might be, oh my gosh, now I need so much because I'm just this tiny little wave. Uh, and then the third being, well, all the other waves are going to mess me up. <laughs> so there are the three poisons that are, um, you know, our motivation then because of this mistaken I other uh perception that started the whole ball rolling. Then we uh, act out of that and create all sorts of terrible karma that throws us into more and more terrible situations. And then we get more and more desperately um, competitive or needy or ignorant and so on. And so the habits develop very strongly and habit and karma are very closely related. Uh, you know, it shapes our mind. Um, and, and so then it can be this, you know, kind of this self perpetuating uh, wheel. And they do in Tibetan refer to samsara as korwa, which means going around. Mm -hmm. The wheel of samsara. Exactly. And so here we are in these times with, um, you know, just an extreme version of all that. And you might wonder, is, is it really worse right now than ever before? Or, you know, it sure seems like it. And I'm here to say that I think it actually is worse. Uh, so there were uh, mm. a lot of predictions that this one master who came to Tibet and actually transformed it into a Buddhist country made at 1,200 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and they were sprinkled all over in the uh, cycles of teachings that he hid in various places and he meant for them to be revealed at different times. So he would predict so-and-so will reveal this um, cycle of uh, teachings uh, in this place at this time. And then it came to pass. And this happened again and again and again. Uh, so he's got a pretty amazing track record with predictions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you might wonder, well, how can those predictions really work? You know, how does, how do predictions work? And here's just a little hint that I have in my own mind as a sort of hypothesis. Um, first of all, uh, we know both from modern science and from uh, Buddhist tradition and other traditions that time is not actually linear. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Another thing is that the universe is constructed as a hologram. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, David Bohm talked about uh, hollow movement. Uh, and, you know, others have talked about the holographic structure of the universe. And the Buddha talked about it, too, that all of the deities are in our bodies, for example. Um, and so it is a holographic structure. So if those two things are the case, time not being linear and holographic structure of the universe, then somebody who is fully realized, uh, fully enlightened Buddha, would be able to predict with perfect accuracy, what they could see from any time, past or future, because they're beyond time, mm -hmm. beyond the perception of time being a linear movement. Yeah. Uh, so he did make some very interesting predictions about these times specifically. And yes, they are, as the Chinese would say, interesting times. Mm. You know, the Chinese curse may live in interesting times. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are in very interesting times. He sprinkled these predictions uh, throughout a lot of these uh, treasures, as they were called, these teachings that were uh, hidden in various places. Um, and so I remember asking my teacher like 20 years ago about the predictions and, <clears throat> you know, could we get a hold of the text with those predictions and translate them? And he said, uh, not really, because they're sprinkled all over the place. Uh, well, finally, because the lamas were starting to notice that um, a lot of the predictions they knew about were coming to pass, 
specifically predictions about uh, more, you know, really dire times, um, they thought, well, somebody had better collate the, you know, somebody better gather these together. And so one Lama did. <clears throat> and not much of it has been translated, but uh, my teacher did provide, you know, some highlights <laughs> and wrote a mm-hmm. letter uh, to any English speakers who were interested. And we have put that up on a website uh, which is an acronym for saving each other together because there were not only predictions, but um, prescriptions. And so <clears throat> on that website, SEOT, which is the acronym, SEOT, S-E-O-T, dot, uh, SEOT, sorry, SEOT project.org. Um, so we can yeah, we'll have a link in the show uh, notes. provide that link. Mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, 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 perfect. So people can go there <clears throat> And see some highlights of the predictions and also what they can do. And there are <clears throat> recordings of teachings about that and so on. And anybody's welcome. Of course, it's not for one sangha. It's for all of us who mm-hmm. live on earth, yeah. <laughs> who are concerned. <laughs> but probably the main um, thing that we need to do is starting with ourselves to... Um, reverse this strong uh, compulsion to um, put our own ego first and uh, to identify with ego and then have it in the driver's seat and so on. And to counteract that by opening up our view to seeing the whole ocean, not just ourselves as a wave and the nearby waves and our, <clears throat> are they good for us or bad for us and that sort of thing. And so uh, I think the four immeasurables, for example, as well as shamatha and vipassana, are um, extremely good medicine because we need to train our minds out of that. Uh, So one thing I want to mention is that uh, the Buddha and um, this Guru Rinpoche who made the predictions were aware that consciousness goes through... um, what I would uh, describe as like biorhythms. So they have their ups and their downs and it's in a rhythm. And um, we're obviously in a downswing. Mm. So that is why uh, the ego being in the driver's seat right now is so extreme and the us them thinking is so solid seeming. But actually they're just points of view and they can be changed and we can change ourselves and each other. Uh, we can affect that. And uh, when we make the change in ourselves and then we touch other people uh, as we walk through our lives, uh, and just even on the cushion, what we put out into the soup of consciousness in this great ocean, um, that affects things. That affects uh, the, you know, it moves against that tendency in the downward swing of that biorhythm. And the thick fog of um, ego clinging, um, e- you know, begins to lighten up a little bit. We mm. can affect that. Beautiful. You're you're weaving so many things that resonate in my heart. So vibration being one of them, you know, my, a mm. lot of my practice is related to sound and music and seeing really? that, that thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like mm. not, not a yoga and um, um, sound healing and, and music and basically using listening as a tool for mindfulness is kind of what I, my, my, my world, let's say deep listening. Uh, I'm sorry. I have to jump in. I I have music in my background and yeah, I, you know, feel just intrinsically the power of sound. And, um, so yeah. So in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, of course, mantra is extremely important. So, uh, actually I was hoping we could talk a little about that, uh, today as well. So, one of the prescriptions, um, more than one actually, uh, that Guru Rinpoche talked about was sound in the form of mm-hmm. archetypal sound, which is mantra. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go on. You were going to say more of that. No, know. no, not at all. Because so the last thing I heard you say was that um, this uh, Guru Rinpoche, that, that's his name? The yeah. Person? Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that sound and vibration and uh, is is part of the recipe of how to get through this, how to kind of weather this storm. Is that was that what I heard? Yes, uh, mm-hmm. that's a powerful method uh, because yeah. 
Mantra is archetypal sound, Mm -hmm. right? Yes. Uh, And so even the Tibetans use Sanskrit for their mantras Mm -hmm. for that reason, because it's an archetypal sound language. It was never just spoken in the streets, you know? Right, right. So then were you going to say more? Because I sort of jumped in there. No, no. Actually, interestingly enough, we spoke with someone who wrote a book called Psyche and the Singularity a few episodes ago about Jung and the holographic theory and black holes and really fascinating oh, yes. episode connecting a lot of these. Th- I know. I was so excited when I heard that episode. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, because yeah, was- Jung, Jungian uh, psychology is part of my background. I have an MA in counseling psychology, and that oh, was cool. my main uh course of study was Jungian. Right. Yes. I think I heard, wait, I think I, oh, I listened to your interview with Thomas Hubel and maybe that came up in that interview too. Mm, mm-hmm. But yeah, the, I love the, the Dharma of, of waves and the ocean and water because, you know, the Buddha often taught with, about the four elements. And I, I think that there's just something so rich about y- using the four elements and, you know, th- this idea that each of us is these little peaks of waves that come up from a vast ocean of consciousness, you know, and each of us is so ephemeral, you know, we, we have like mm-hmm. a, a millisecond of, of peaking up from the ocean and then we fall back into that, that ocean, you know, in, in Mahayana, they call it emptiness. So the, yep. the interconnected void that, that, that all creation comes from and returns to. Right. And, um, y- you know, trying to translate into English, uh, Emptiness versus mm-hmm. void and so on it, uh, gets kind of thorny and interesting, <laughs> all sorts right. of things, because it's this very pregnant emptiness uh, that's sort of like before form, if you will. Mm-hmm. It gives birth to all form. And it's actually not like a linear thing where first there's emptiness and then there's form. It's all simultaneous. Mm-hmm. So uh, as we sort of tune into that level of um, reality, where it's this whole ocean of emptiness and form, emptiness and form all the time, uh, you know, the Prajnaparamita and all of that, um, then I think it helps us to understand how it is that there are qualities to this emptiness like um, loving kindness and compassion. You know, it's ultimate love because all, love is about joining, you know, deep, deep uh, connection. Uh, you know, affectionate connection. And uh, what could be more connected than the unity that underlies everything, all of us? Mm. Um, And so through that, quite naturally, if somebody over here is suffering, uh, then we feel it if we're tuned in to the whole ocean level. So these four Brahma Viharas are four Mm. avenues into um, deep, natural connection, the truth of our deep natural connection. And so then we can live from that. You look at somebody like His Holiness the Dalai Lama and, you know, many of these masters who um, just, you know, walk through life with that deep heartfelt connection, as well as the deep insight um, and realization uh, and the truth of that. Then if they're living from that, uh, why would they ever want to harm somebody? Mm. Uh, because they can feel that connection. I think empathy and compassion are the antidote to violence. Because mm. how can you do violence to somebody if you're feeling that deep, heartfelt connection? And so I love teaching um, the, the Bravo Haras. And actually, I'm about to in Boulder, Colorado, mm. uh, the first weekend in March. Mm-hmm. And so uh, people can tune in online or come there in person. And uh, I'm going to be not only teaching it, I, th- I think of it as a retreat where I introduce these practices and then we do the practices and we actually unpack it together. And already Sangha begins to form as uh, we break out into uh, groups of uh, well, pairs. It, we break out into dyads and really unpack, well, what just happened to me in this practice? And How do I feel different after having done the practice? Mm -hmm. What we're trying to do is treat these uh, four Brahma Viharas, and I'm going to say what they are, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Mm -hmm. 
these are not passing sentiments, but capacities mm -hmm. that we have innately um, to some extent, but because of our ego-driven habits over many lifetimes, we need to expand those capacities. And so these are very skillful um, practices that help us to develop those capacities strongly so that then we can get off the cushion and walk through life uh, with much more compassion and so on. And so w when I'm in a difficult conversation with somebody and they're actually coming at me with accusations, for example, or something, you know, challenging, I'm able, uh, through shamatha vipassana as well as, uh, you know, feeling compassion, I can still keep uh, my frontal lobes online and not just go into fight or flight. And I can actually navigate through that challenging moment and we can become all the more connected for having talked out something difficult. <laughs> and we encourage that in our sangha. Do think that these methods are um, underlying even the uh, prescriptions that um, Guru Rinpoche gave us for navigating through these times, uh, because the mantras are helping us to d develop, um, you know, more capacity to see and feel reality as it really is. Rather, you know, we're all. Um, create we are the star of our own video and we're creating the video <laughs> and we don't even realize it mm -hmm. you know we think it's happening to us and mm -hmm. so how's that going to go <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it's it, we look around it's not going very well yeah yeah i think you know especially practicing in sangha and and chanting as you're talking about there's you know, science tells us that you know oxytocin becomes released when we when we join in song with other people and we our vibe our bodies vibrate as one. There's a, a deep transformation that can happen. And, you know, anyone who's even done a sing along, you know, when you sing Happy Birthday <laughs> in a group, you feel good, you know, because mm -hmm. of that that sharing of that oneness that happens through through song and through chanting and mantra. Um, Absolutely, and so uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, actually group practice and even practice uh, with one other person are seen as essential on the path to enlightenment. It's uh, group practice is done, um, you know, all over Tibet and relied upon a lot because of what you're talking about. And I think uh, if I can even go into that a bit more, um, you know, f for example, at a, a Taylor Swift concert, you know, people, get completely swept up in a way that they never would if they're just listening at home to a recording of her singing that same song. And it's the power of mm -hmm. all of these people thinking about the same thing at the same time. So, for example, uh, in our sangha, we do very typical Tibetan Buddhist thing. Uh, every year, we do a group practice for a week long. Uh, so most of our waking hours every day for that week, we are doing these uh, very symbolic ceremonies and it's very archetypal. Uh, and the theme is one particular aspect of uh, enlightened mind personified by or symbolized by uh, this or that deity. So for example, mm -hmm. if it's Tara, green Tara, um, she's like uh, the mother of all and she's green. I mean, she's Mother Nature, uh, this kind of thing. And so um, there are lots of associated qualities to that and so on. And so everybody is tuning into the Tara channel, if you will. Mm -hmm. And you can tune into, uh, you know, Wrathful Guru Rinpoche. And that's a very different quality of enlightened mind. But there's only one enlightened mind, actually. And so all of these are avenues in. Mm -hmm. um, and so while we're practicing that week, we're doing all of these symbolic things of inviting her presence in and, you know, offering her wonderful incense and flowers and so on and so forth. And we're chanting all of this melodiously. Mm -hmm. And um, what we're chanting, uh, of course, is the imagery and so on that are evocative of the archetype. You can't perceive the archetype directly very easily. Uh, once the, a person reaches, reaches a certain level of mastery, it's more possible. But still, 
uh, the masters I know of use these tools to uh, tune into the channel of Tara or Guru Rinpoche or whoever it might be. And so that week then, we all work together to tune into that channel and we invite her in and so on and so forth. And then we invite her into ourselves and become Tara. Mm. And we can do this because of the holographic structure of everything. Mm -hmm. Tara and everybody else are in within us as much as out there, right? It's the whole ocean. And so um, then we can manifest enlightened mind through the Tara channel or the, uh, you know, whatever it might be, um, Hematroctum channel, Vajrakalaya channel or whatever it is, these different facets of enlightened mind that we can bring out and really tune into and use as an avenue to pure um, awareness. Yeah, the, the the facets of enlightened mind reminds me too that, you know, we think about well, just for lack of a better word, I'll say living saints like the Dalai Lama or Thich Nhat Hanh or Pema Chodron, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they seem to have the qualities of, of awakeness, uh, you know, being awakened or enlightened or whatever. Um, but they still have this this uh, very particular personality which still shines through, which to me mm -hmm. always uh, gives me hope that, you know, becoming enlightened doesn't mean to become like a Dharma zombie who's just like, you know, <laughs> Uh, acting in in a kind of uniform way, but that there's a there's a really beautiful diversity in in states of awakening. Oh, absolutely! And um, I was saying a little bit ago that ego is not something to just get rid of. It's mm -hmm. not as though we need to perform an egoectomy. Right. <laughs> the ego is a part of our psyche. It's just not uh, meant to be in the driver's seat. Uh, so Jung would say that self with a small s isn't supposed to be running things, but self with a big s, you know, which is mm -hmm. the one big awareness um, that is in all of these uh, myriad forms, you know, these um, waves on the ocean that are countless and every one of them is unique. And so we get to be unique and we get to creatively bring uh, enlightened mind through uh, in whatever ways make sense to us in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so we never have to have that egoectomy after all. Mm -hmm. uh, and getting back to um, this, uh, you know, avenue in through this or that uh, deity or archetypal form, archetypal image, using archetypal sound, mm -hmm. tuning into that channel. Uh, and that's an avenue into just pure enlightened mind, pure Buddha mind or awareness. Um, I w was wondering if you'd be interested in my leading a short practice that uh, Definitely, yeah. we could experience that with, and it's luckily very short. <laughs> so you mentioned His Holiness. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you mentioned His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, and he, uh, the Tibetans believe him to be um, the manifestation of Chenrezig, or Avalokiteshvara, as he's called in um, Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is an archetype that I'll, you know, give you a little bit of a flavor of. Mm -hmm. So the image of Chenrezig is that he's um, this guy who is uh, as white as a conch shell. Um, they come in all different colors. So, uh, you know, he happens to be white. And um, he's got four arms, and two of them are at his heart, and they're holding um, this blue wish-fulfilling jewel. Um, I should mention that he is the um, deity of compassion, and he is what's known as a, um, a, a maha bodhisattva, or a great bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the great bodhisattvas have come to the right, uh, to the edge, the very dividing line between um, differentiation enough to still be somebody and just the wave going all the way back into the ocean and, you know, dissolving into the bliss of that ocean because it is pure, just as it's pure love and connection and so on and so forth, it's also pure joy. Um, but he 
uh, and the other great bodhisattvas chose to hold themselves back from crossing that line so that they could be of benefit to beings all the way until samsara is emptied and everybody reaches enlightenment. Um, so that's a pretty amazing um, sort of vow uh, for somebody to take uh, because it must, uh, you know, that must be somewhat painful to be just this side of that line. But anyway, uh, so he's retained enough intention to still be a resource to us. Um, and so we can tune into the compassion channel, if you will, to, uh, use him as an avenue in. Um, so uh, again, uh, he's got the two arms in his heart and then he's got two other arms. One is holding a mala and the other is holding a flower. And he's got the various marks of enlightenment. He's dressed in silks and so on. He's wearing this beautiful jeweled crown and he has a big top knot, which is one of the marks of enlightenment. Um, and so then uh, we imagine him above and in front of us. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, uh, just, we're going to end up, it, we start with just saying one sentence and then we just chant his name again and again and again. And um, as we do this, he is... Um, above and in front of us, and he's naturally just pouring out uh, light rays of all different colors and uh, little mind drops uh, known as bindus or tigles um, that are pouring off of him. And this is how we can really get infected by that state of mind is by uh, making ourselves very porous and soaking in these light rays and these Tiglays or Bindus, as we recite his name. So you can see how we're using image and sound to tune into this channel and thereby uh, be able to um, invoke and evoke compassion. This is the compassion channel. So now I'll invite you to imagine Chenrezig above and in front of you. And then uh, you can recite with me and uh, we can share the image and the words uh, later. And we say, Bodhisattva of great mind and great compassion, highest in Raisi, the powerful, I pay homage. I make offerings and take refuge. Continue to be porous and soak in all of these blessings or um, being infected by Buddha mind. feeling his inconceivably great compassion. You feel yourself settling in more and more and soaking in more and more of this. And allow yourself to feel that compassion for you as well. Feel that as a balm for whatever suffering is up for you. You might even pick some specific suffering. Feel that balm. Thank you. 
your chin's right here. Feel chin raisey to be this lens that's focusing the compassion of the entire vast ocean of pregnant awareness out of which we all come. Focusing it right now on you, but it's going out in all directions as well. And if your mind wanders, or rather when it wanders, you just bring it back and settle back into this lovely, beautiful thing that's happening. Chin raisey, chin raisey, chin raisey, chin raisey. And so now that we have just been filled up with this direct experience of compassion from the depths of the ocean of awareness, mm. which we are made of, that's what we are made of. We want to pass this out to all of our fellow waves on the ocean. And so we dedicate whatever positive karma we created from this practice and just the joy that we've experienced to the relief of suffering uh, that everybody has suffered uh, in samsara, uh, similarly to whatever we had in mind of our suffering. For example, sickness or being misunderstood or lonely or any of the things that we might have been imagining just now and feeling. Um, we want all beings to be completely relieved of those and all kinds of suffering permanently. And may we all rest in that great ocean of awareness directly. Thank you, Lama Soma. That was really a beautiful offering. Thank you. Thank you so much. I forgot to mention that that was um, a gift specifically to me from the Jikung Kandro, who is uh, a woman, highly realized woman master in Tibet, uh, who is still alive today. Mm -hmm. uh, she's truly one of the last of the great, you know, really great realized lamas from old Tibet. Mm, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm glad I could share it. Yeah. <laughs> For a, a song was coming up to mind that I used to sing in a choir when I was in high school. <laughs> and oh. I know it's based on a, a Navajo prayer. Now I walk in beauty. Beauty is before me. Beauty <gasps> is behind me. Beauty is above me and below me. And we used to sing it as music. Now I walk in music. Music is before me. Ah. And I was, I was really feeling that, the, the kind of white mm. light, the vibration of just pure energy as, as that mm. sound almost. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, and that's one of the few chants that mm. you know, we don't do with a melody, by the way. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> but I actually think I that's know okay. that uh, particular song, and it's done in a round the way I know it. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah, I just sang that with my uh, daughters and granddaughter over the holidays. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs>
So we we touched into compassion there with that lovely offering and uh, and uh, to loving kindness with metta. Mm -hmm. One one of the Brahma Viharas I'm wanted to ask about if if you have still have time to, for a few more a few more minutes is yeah. equanimity. Yeah, because I often find that equanimity, like if you have a if you have a nice life ex, uh, life circumstances, let's say it's easy for equanimity to sort of slide into apathy and to slide into spiritual bypassing. Yeah. Um, so are you addressing that on the, in your retreat that you're, the workshop that you're creating now on the Brahma Viharas about how to work skillfully with equanimity? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned the near enemy of equanimity, which is indifference. Uh, and that those two things are not the same. Mm -hmm. We, in the context of the Brahma Maharas, we need to think in terms of um, feeling uh, equal compassion for those we dearly love and uh, those we don't know at all, and even those we find challenging. And like we think of in the as being in the them category. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I actually save equanimity for the last one because I feel uh, the practices incorporate um, equanimity in the experience of the practice itself. But then when I, you know, actually talk about it and work with people on it, that's when I feel like they might be ready to really challenge themselves and do it with somebody who has been difficult for them. Mm -hmm. Do, uh, you know, feel just as much caring and affection and uh, connectedness to those people as the people they prefer, because obviously the opposite is of the far enemy of equanimity is preference. Mm -hmm. uh, but equanimity is meant not to be, oh, you know, everybody is the same, and so they're all kind of okay, <laughs> mm -hmm. but that we feel deep uh, compassion and loving kindness and so on for everybody equally. So that, again, is a capacity that we have to work to develop, but we can. And these simple, very simple practices that anybody can do anytime, you know, for a few minutes at a time, um, have an effect. They help us to take what is innate uh, compassion or loving kindness or sympathetic joy and be able to mature it and expand it and bring it forward. So the word in Tibetan for Buddhahood um, or a Buddha is Sanje. And Sang means um, cleanse. And Je means uh, like bring forward or mature. And so we're clearing away confusion and, um, you know, the weight of... Uh, bad habits of mind and so on that have left their traces on our uh, mind stream. We clear all that stuff away and we bring forward our true nature, mm -hmm. you know, straight from our oceanness. Mm -hmm. Going all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, uh, we talked a bit about American Buddhism and uh, maybe, you know, the different branches of it within American Buddhism, what's different, what's the same. And um, we I touched very quickly on the rugged individualism sort of idea um, and how we've sort of dropped the third jewel of uh, community or sangha. And um, I remember reading this book called The Purpose Driven Church by Rick Warren, which you wouldn't expect me to read maybe as a Jewish Buddhist, but because uh, he's an evangelist Christian. <laughs> But I'm willing to learn from anybody, and why not him? Um, he really had Sangha dialed in. <laughs> and yes, um, and there's so much we could be doing about that. And I've noticed uh, from the students that uh, they are just so thirsting for connection. Um, and you were saying earlier how... Um, connecting online has been both wonderful and also problematic because it's not in person and it's not the same thing. But even so, I have found that we can often uh, get past the non-immediacy of, uh, for example, Zoom or a phone call or something 
if I call people's attention to and bring their focus to the ocean piece so that we can feel ourselves to be waves on that ocean and how we actually are connected uh, ultimately as being, you know, full-fledged members of the ocean. We are made of ocean. What else are we made of? So, um, it, you know, it's hard for us to connect in that way. Uh, we aren't Guru Rinpoche. <laughs> but um, it is the truth of things that we can feel somehow. And so if I call people's attention to it and kind of bring them in there a little bit, I begin the meetings, you know, in a bit of a meditation, just a short meditation where we tune into that. We tune into that level of actually being together um, so that it is possible to connect more deeply and feel our togetherness. And we're just using Zoom as an extra crutch, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> um, and also we teach Sangha skills. Um, so specifically, how do you say a difficult thing to a fellow Sangha member? Uh, so nonviolent communication is something that all of our staff members have studied. We've offered, and we will again, um, to Sangha members, uh, retreats specifically on that and other Sangha skills, uh, which are taught by mainly by um, Aaron Stern, or else they're taught by our teachers who have learned from Aaron Stern, who is the founder of the Academy for the Love of Learning. And they are very skilled at um, these kinds of deep connection um, skills that can be developed, as well as having the difficult conversations and even not needing to get so far as to need the difficult conversations because we're able to connect in a more skillful way. So then we can arrive at beloved community, as Martin Luther King put it. And this is something that I think all of us human beings deeply need. It is a human need. But it's also useful on the path to enlightenment. So in, in my 25 years of teaching, I have found that people who practice alone, on their own, without sangha, don't stay with it. They just don't. So anybody listening, if you want to have a daily practice, um, practice with others. And we have uh, beginning classes like an on-ramp to daily practice. And I have a book that's an on-ramp to daily practice that's a journal, but it encourages you to practice with others so that you actually continue to practice. If you want to do this for a short time and then fall off the wagon, practice alone. <laughs> it's a sure method. <laughs> so it's as simple as that. So I wanted to uh, touch on that a bit more and also mention that um, there are two kinds of bodhicitta, there, uh, which means heart, mind of enlightenment, bodhicitta. Uh, so there's aspirational and engaged bodhicitta. And we strongly encourage people uh, not just to sit on the cushion and develop this stuff. Yes, that affects the world just when you're sitting on the cushion because we're full-fledged uh, card-carrying members of the ocean. But also because, um, but in addition to that, we need to uh, get up off the cushion and then what are we doing the rest of the day? When would we stop acting from bodhicitta? Uh, so when would we stop uh, doing compassionate acts to help others. Uh, so it, it's both and very much. And they reinforce each other. Your practice on the cushion will get better if you've been acting from compassion and loving kindness and caring throughout the day. And if you practice on the cushion, you can bring that to your activities so that you're not one of these people who joins an activist group and everybody in the group is fighting with each other and then they go out and fight against the people they've decided is other, you know, the, in the us, them, they're fighting against them, you know, which is actually perpetuating the problem. So it's both and on the cushion and off the cushion. There's no time not to. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. So those are, yeah, those are the last thoughts I had. Okay, cool. Yeah. That, that is a very important uh, point that the engaged, engaged bodhicitta and aspirational. So thank you for, for highlighting that. I was just, I was just saying, thank you. Thank you for all that you offer today. And, um, all the beautiful jewels of the Dharma that you put forth today. Well, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity for this conversation. And I'm so glad that we can 
not only enjoy it with each other, but share it out with everybody. Uh, I love the sand community. I love what sand is about. And so I am honored and happy to be able to share this with all of my fellow sand members. Oh, beautiful. Well, we love you too. And let's do this again. (laughs) Yeah. So thank you, Lama. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of sand content, available exclusively to sand members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify. And share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.